let's look at association measures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So tonight we're going to talk about collocations. So collocations are words that occur together more frequently than may be expected if it were all due to chance. Sometimes people call these colexemes or bigrams. Um, you can also trigrams, multigrams. And these are um, anything that is more than you might expect due to random noise. So something like peanut butter. Ingrams are in words that occur together. So a bigram is every two words that occur together. A trigram would be three, etc. So a unigram is one. We're mostly going to focus on pairs of words. And then we're going to talk about Google's ingrams options. So you can look at ingrams by going to their website. And so you could look at their, their brief examples, Albert Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, and Frankenstein. Right? We could also look at some other ones, but we're going to come back to that in a little bit because we're also going to talk about um, culturomics today and um, how they used engrams to understand culture. But I really love XKCD. It's a web comic, a math comic. He's got like a list of his favorite engram charts. And so, like, you can look at um, presidents, uh, the Great War, war, the World War, and World War One. So he's just got, like, a bunch of his favorite ones that you can check out um, based on his favorite math charts. Ack, sorry. And then the last thing, which I tried to show, is the TED Talk that is what this article for this week is based on. So uh, I highly recommend the TED Talk. It's like 12 or 14 minutes. And the two guys who wrote the paper that's attached for this week um, give a talk on what the paper says, basically. And they're much more entertaining in person than they are in boring research report form. Um, and it's just a really excellent summary of kind of what we're doing today. And so what they propose is called culturomics. I want it to be culturonomics, like freakonomics, but it's not. It's culturomics. Um, so it's like a bunch of people at Google who used their Google data set. And the Google's data set is like 5% of written books or something to this effect. It's 500 million or maybe 500 billion. It's a bunch of words. Um, so if you're ever searching for something and you find the Google books and it only shows you like every third page or something, it's because they got sued due to copyright issues. But this data set is available. It's way too big to download. So you have to do some special processing to use it, but, um, you can play with it through the Ngrams website, uh, or kind of what we're doing. We can use these ideas and apply them to data sets that are much more workable on our end. And what they were trying to do was figure out and figure out um, cultural trends and other sort of human things based on the, the output system that we see, which is language, which is the whole point of this class. So 4% um, of printed books uh, digitized by Google. It's a corpus of 500 billion words and there are multiple languages. So you can play with the Ingram website in 10 or 15 languages, I think, at this point. <clears throat> and what they did was they estimated that English, like how many words are there? I get asked this a lot when people find out that I study words. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not like a walking dictionary, right? But they estimated that English is about 1 million different words that are at least one per billion. So that's a lot of freaking words. Okay, I would say about 20,000 words are the ones that we use on a weekly, like a normal basis. Um, so we are only using a small proportion of the uh, lexicon that's available to us. But if you think about once per billion, we're way out on the tail of Zip's Law, right? So I'm talking about words that almost never occur. Um, and the dictionary, like the literal Merriam-Webster dictionary, only covers a really small portion of these words. And that's because it, it used to be a restriction in printing. Right? So you only want to print 
um, the most frequent words that people are literally going to look up. But now that the dictionary doesn't really get printed anymore, um, it's sort of interesting that the, the, if something like Merriam-Webster only really still shows you a small proportion of the words, because I just don't want to devote the space to every single word that people don't really use. And another proof for Zip's Law in action. But the neat stuff about that they have done um, that will play with Google's engrams options for is thinking about culture and language shift across time. So American English and British English at some point diverged in a wood, right? So um, as our cultures shifted, um, what we see is differences in word usage. Um, oh, that's a good point. Words created by authors. I'm not sure that that would make the one million, at least once per billion, maybe. So I'm thinking of um, my favorite weird word book is A Clockwork Orange, right? Other than things that like Tolkien that have um, made up languages, right? I don't know if those count. That's a great question. I'm not sure if they count because they're not technically English, but then that depends on whose definition we're using, right? Um, so I don't, I don't know that those techniques would, would totally count, but it's a good question to see if we see, um, words like Elvish. Anyways, so, um, back to this American and British thing. So at one point, um, in the, you know, obviously once America separated and, uh, there are different forms of of English, there's actually a, a separate version of Canadian English that's like a weird blend of American and British and French. Um, but if we look at just traditional American English and British English, um, we can see when one language sort of dominated the other. And so we'll look at the regular and irregular form of verbs here. So burnt and burned. Burned is the regular version of the past tense marker. Burnt is the irregular form. Found is irregular. Find it is regular, which is actually odd. Like I never would have said find it. I would have expected a child to say that and us to be like, hee hee, that's so cute, right? So, but find it for a while was um, the or was the proper form. And then the same kind of dwelt and dwelled. So let's go over here to engrams and let's look at those. We're going to look at English English. Okay. I'll make this a little bigger. There we go. So we're going to be burnt and burned, which we've clearly done before. And what you can see is a shift in the uh, irregular usage of the word to a more regular usage of the word. So at this point, in the 1880s, um, the regular form actually took over. And so you, you see that across several different um, options. Dwelt and dwelled. Search. Okay. Where this hasn't quite happened yet, but they, they think that dwelled at some point will overtake dwelt. But you can see it's on the downward slide. Because most people don't actually use this term anymore. It's more um, lived. Is that what we use it instead? Let's do the last one, which was found. Find it. And we can see that found has not really changed. So we can do that same thing in American English. Burnt and burned is a better one. Okay. Um, where the shift is a bit earlier to switch to the regularized form. We can do the same thing in British English. And the shift is much later. So you can tell that um, in Britain, sort of the UK version of English, that burnt is the more common form until about 1975. Um, and culturally, we brought that with us, we being, me being American, right, brought that with us, but then we dropped it like an old hat because as we're splitting, 
from Britain and moving away from and developing our own culture, we switched more to the regularized form. And so that's a really nice demonstration of just a simple thing like verb usage that can show you cultural shifts um, by calculating frequencies in language. And it's all about frequency, like I said a couple weeks ago. Um, if you don't know the answer, it's frequency. Check versus check. Well, that's a, like a French thing, I think, though. That's a French influence to spell it that way, I think. Well, we can look at that one. Yeah, so in American English, you never see the, the Q form. Let's see what British English people do. Yeah, it's still mostly the traditional English form. Although you do see a, a more of the sort of French influence than I might expect. Let's look at French then. As we should see. Well, that's fascinating. They've switched to regular check. I think that's the French form of the word check, right? Like, a, that's not the one I meant. You mean like, okay, you do mean literal check, like a, like, like a bank check, right? And not like a, um, this is verify. That's not quite the, the word I want. Let's, uh, let's see here. Control. Literal check. Okay, good. <laughs> now, ah, le check. Okay. Le, le check. My French is terrible sometimes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think you might actually get a more interesting picture if you picked... Um, in one point, they had it where you could separate by author type. And if you look at, like, Canadians, that's what you where you probably see the difference. Um, so this little bit, maybe English fiction, you might get a little bit more action. Get this, this is probably that influence there. <clears throat> That's not even the best part. That's the verb stuff. <clears throat> Some other cool things that they did, and this is all in that paper for this week. So if you like this, definitely make sure you're checking out the paper. And their um, TED Talk covers a lot of these and more. Okay. So, um... If we look at the frequency of naming for famous people, um, so looking at how often they're mentioned, now this would be a super interesting, if you could, if you had this kind of data for now that isn't something like Twitter, obviously, um, this would be an interesting analysis because of that 15 minutes of fame idea. And what they, they showed was that famous people, um, presidents, authors, um, actors, actresses, have this like sort of rapid fame rise, a peak, and then what's called the half-life. So they, they, they kind of fade out of cultural memory. Um, but that rise to fame, the, 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 uh, the increase is determined by job choice. <laughs> so actors show their earliest, the peaks early in their lives, which isn't too surprising because we tend to like um, younger actors, um, but what you might see is that older actors have a longer half-life okay, than writers and politicians, and um, they make the joke in the TED Talk that uh, mathematicians pretty much never rise to fame, which is what those guys are, is mathematicians. So he's like, well, I picked the wrong, um, the wrong uh, field to be in, right? Um, but I think scientists now, it might be interesting, people like Bill Nye or Neil deGrasse Tyson to look at sort of the half-life of scientists as well, um, because it kind of depends on how the uh, news is treating you that day. Um, but to me, the most fascinating thing that they've done that we can do a couple of examples on is censorship. And so what we'll see is culture, in a culture, there's obviously going to be those in power and those not in power. And um, kind of 1984 style, there is suppression of certain topics. I think this maybe changes a little bit um, with globalization of culture and the internet, but um, obviously there are countries where the internet is completely controlled by the government, so it's, it still goes on. Um, and what we see, and we're going to talk about Russia and Trotsky, uh, Germany and Marc Chagall, who's Jewish, 
China and um, Tiananmen Square. And U.S., the Hollywood 10, which was um, an era that where people were blacklisted being an actor or an actress, I think this is during the uh, Red Scare Center communism. And so this is not this is not an American thing. This is not a foreign country thing. This is every country has these moments. And so these are a little hard to read, but um, up here on the right this is Marc Chagall. And so we look at I think he's a painter. Um, we look at his mentions in English, right? So he starts a little slower because he was German. So it took, us, it took a while before it became, came over to English. But in German, what you see is this rapid rise to fame and it should continue upwards. The trend should continue and go be not linear, but like if you um, did kind of a smoothing function, at least a little linear. But this huge dip here indicates the suppression. And look at the time period. So this is during World War One, World War Two, and he's Jewish. Um, for Trotsky, if we look at several different um, lingual, cultural language variants, you see these um, depressions in his mentions. And so I, I, I think this is easier to explain to people when you talk about it, talk about it like it's Twitter. Like suddenly everyone stops talking about you. You're trending, and then it stops. Um, and then Tiananmen Square, right, so you get this kind of uh, depression of that topic, and the Hollywood um, 10, so there's 10 different people here, and you get this huge, like, decrease in people talking about them, because they were blacklisted from, from working, basically. And so this is during our Americans of Communism, Red Scare, McCarthy era. Um, so we see this pattern where it should be uh, continuing an upward trend, but there's a decrease then faster than we might expect. If you want to see something a little bit more recent, so I'm going to go to American English up to 2009, and let's just cut off 19, 1940 to 2009, and I'm going to do Martin Luther King. And Malcolm X. Um, and so what we see here is this rapid rise to fame and then this weird depression. Right? So this is during, I mean it's actually a little bit probably after, but, but um, sort of during race, this is the later race riots and um, the civil rights, the civil rights has never really ended, but like that civil rights era, right, um, is how they got to these points, uh, rapid rise of fame, but you can tell there's this weird depression here. Martin Luther King probably should not have this like dip, but you see the same thing for Malcolm X. Okay. Oh, let's make a, who's a good comparison here? Oh, I'm not sure if I know a good comparison. Let's put in a couple presidents. So Richard Nixon would be good at that time. Let's just see what his looks like. You don't, you, okay, so he's just a little bit later, but you don't see that same dip where they go back up. His is the rapid rise of frame and then the de, the decrease. Okay. So that's a good like comparison line. If, if Martin Luther King's just continued down and off, that would not be suppression, but it's the fact that it's got that, that U-shaped dip. Okay. So this is like a really fascinating analysis if I have the capability to look at this stuff over time. So this to me is the most interesting thing that you can do and you can play with different um, cultural moments as long as the data is available on Google. Um, so some considerations, some criticisms of this project, some, some things I have to remember is that uh, OCR, optical character recognition, is not perfect. <laughs> and so in earlier time points, so from like 1800, a little before, or way before that, um, S's kind of, or F's kind of looks like fancy S's, and so sometimes you can't get um, these, these, uh, you're, you're seeing some false positives or maybe false negatives. Um, the metadata is never, is not perfect because I didn't do all this by hand, they were scanning. So some dates, 
maybe we can't get super fine tuned on our date, so we have to take a zoomed out view of across a you know hundred years or so. Uh, and then the biggest problem is synonymy. Okay, sometimes it's called polysemy. There are multiple meanings over time, and you can't totally figure out those trends sometimes. So something like tweet. If you look at the n-gram for tweet, I'll move back up to 1800. It will look like we've used tweet less and less. And that's because when these books for tweet are literally talking about birds, right? And now we see it's like tailed way off. If we had more recent or more online data, we'd probably say it go back up, right? But that rise would not mean suddenly that everyone was fascinated with birds again. Although I'll tell you what, this week I am because I have some stupid birds nesting in like the little part of one of my roof holes and I can't. Apparently, it's illegal to remove them until after they're done nesting, and I'm stuck with some birds, like, right outside my office window. So I've been thinking about birds this week, but um, what we might see is instead the Twitter version of tweet. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, take a, a similar approach to... Uh, some of the colexine stuff from last week. Wait, have we done distinctive colexine? Sorry, wrong class. What we're going to do is some new cool stuff and talk about association measures, which will lead us into distinctive colexine analysis for next week. So our main focus here is going to be creating these little um, frequency tables where we're interested in some sort of X variable and some sort of Y variable. And these are going to be individual words. So the example today is going to be cellar door, and we're going to be interested in their um, conditional probabilities, and so this is how you fill out this table. So we can take any two variables we're interested in and calculate the relationship between them using what amounts to a small frequency table. Um, a is the co-occurrence of X and Y together, so something like cellar door. B is the number of occurrences of X without Y. So we're going to do this in a specific order. So we want, what's the probability of door given seller? Right, so what's the likelihood of that pairing together? Um, so we want to know the probability of door given seller. So this would be the number of occurrences of, hold on, I have to like make my little chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seller is Y. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had a brain fart there. Okay. So, seller up here and door oh, down here. So, this would be the probability of door that's not seller. So, every other word that's combined with it. Okay. This would be the probability of seller that everything that's not door. And then D here would be the probability of every other word. And so what we're doing is we're creating frequencies that are the colexeme together or one word with every other word, one word with every other word, or everything else. Um, so there are a couple of ways to calculate association. The main goal here is to look at how related these words are. And we're going to do five or six different ways to calculate relatedness. And I'll tell you my favorites when we're done. Um, and I've forgotten where I was going with that. Oh, so there's two main types of relatedness. One of them is a unidirectional relatedness, or it's asymmetric. And this depends on if you switch rows and columns in the table. So you have to remember that they're conditional. So a conditional probability is something like P of X given Y is not necessarily equal to the probability of y given x. And the way I always think about this is um, if it's raining, then I need my umbrella. So the probability of um, rain given umbrella, uh, probability of, of umbrella given rain is not the same probability as rain given umbrella. Okay. So if I have my umbrella, it may or may not rain. So I just had it, have it. But if it's raining, I probably should have my umbrella. Okay, so 
but the probabilities are not always equal. Bidirectional or symmetric probabilities are ones that it doesn't really matter. And so I tend to like these better because they're just more interpretable. Um, because conditionalized probabilities require me to remember which way it's been conditionalized. But they're both pretty popular. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the, we're going to do what we did for cellar door because I asked a friend of mine, hey, what's a fun phrase that you like? And she's a huge Edgar Allan Poe fan. Um, and so we're going to do the collocate where we make cellar Y and door X. Um, we could do this the other way. It's just the way we've picked for this one. Uh, so it's common to put the colexeme on X. Um, so this means the, the, co, uh, the co-pair, so the second word, um, and the lexeme on Y. So that you're really interested in the probability of the second word given the first word. And I pulled these numbers from the Corpus of Contemporary American English. And every time I open it up, I get different numbers. So I will um, show you how I got these um, with the, the warning that they might be different today. So I went to COCA. Uh, this is hosted at Baylor. Let's just go Corpus. Oh, BYU. Different B school. And I went to COCA. You should not need to log in to do this. Um, if you try to do too many searches at once, it will kind of kick you out. But what you'll do is click on colicates. And so I want seller spelled correctly. Let's try that again. Seller with an A and door. Okay, I'm going to click find colicates. And so this gives me all the combinations together. So it's 176 now because they keep adding to the data set. So that's the combination. That's A, where they are together. I'll click on search again. Now I just want to know how many times um, seller appears in general. No, sorry. Don't. Ah, dang it. Back up. Ah, ah, I'm screwing it up. They got mad at me. Okay, I'm going to click search. I'm going to give seller. I don't want any of the colocates. Go away. Um, well, we could just click on list, actually. That would solve my problem. So click on list to find matching strings. So I would take this number, 2768, minus the door number, because this includes door, so 176, and that would be B. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, no, let's see here, because right, I'm going across. Then I would do that same thing for door. Okay, it would take 145,000 minus 176. Fill that in. And then I will tell you that the, co the corpus is 560 billion. So basically, um, what I originally had for A, uh, it's 30 more options now. And then... Um, uh, B is all the times that this occurs without the other word, right? So you can go back and look at my little chart here. So how many times door occurred without seller? How many times uh, seller occurs without door? And then D is every other option. So 560 billion in COCA. Once you fill those in, the conditional probability of Y given X, this is the probability of seller given door, okay, so door to seller, is 10%. Oh, no, that's less than 10. That's 0.1%. Okay. And so this is the wrong way, right? So it's the probability of, of seller given door. So that would be door to, like, door first. The other way, though, the probability of door, given that seller is happening, is much stronger. It's 5%. Okay. Now, this isn't totally about the order of the words, because this analysis or, uh, ignores uh, frequency of uh, which one comes first. It's more about the likelihood given which one you've seen. So if I have seen the likelihood of seller given door, 
This is if I've seen the word door, how likely is it that cellar is around it somewhere? And it's not very likely because door has lots of other options that, that come with it. Okay, so close the door. Um, this one though is how I, if I've seen cellar, how likely is it the door is in the vicinity, it's in the room, so to speak, it's much more likely because cellar doesn't have that many other collocates okay, or coaxiums. So what this tells me is that these words are probably attracted to each other when cellar occurs. So if cellars are happening, doors around here somewhere. Um, I can hear the neighbors like outside playing baseball. So it's like birds chirping and people playing baseball. It's like the most American thing ever, right? Um, on Memorial Day week. So let me talk about what is attraction. Okay. So attraction is a that conditional probability of the lexeme given the construction. And so there's another one that's reliance or faith, which is the probability of the construction given the lexeme. So attraction, um, let me back up. Attraction is usually the first one, and reliance or faith is usually the second one. So these two words are not really attracted to each other um, in the sense that they don't always co-occur together. This is a low attraction score. Um, because door occurs with so many other words. Okay. However, there is a little bit of reliance or faith on each other because they, they do, when one of them happens, they do seem to kind of come together. Okay. So they're not reliant, meaning they're always together, but they do have a little, I'm sorry, they're not attracted, meaning that they're always together, but there is a little bit of reliance okay, where one relies on the other. So seller often relies on door. <clears throat> now, they're not necessarily going to be the same because um, of the other distribution of the words related. So door has a lot of other friends. Seller doesn't have quite so many friends. Um, another thing to think about is that uh, we have to really account for the size of the corpus. So there are measures of associative strength, the relationship between words that account for these, um, that account for all of the co-occurrences. Because at the moment, we haven't really used D a whole lot. So let me back up. Let's look at these formulas. So we've got A, B, C, D, okay. and the, we have literally not used D at all. So what's the purpose of it? And that's where these contingency-based measures come in. They actually use the entire square. So it accounts for the fact that there are 560 billion words in this data set. And that's important because there are these sort of distinct hierarchies of different features that are important for categories. Um, and so there are words that are more reliant than others. And we're going to talk a lot about category learning a little bit later in the semester. But there's this idea that wings and birds are going to be sort of attracted to each other because they are um, categories, like a bird has wings. Birds also have eyes, but you don't really see those together very often. Okay. Um, so when people talk about them, they generally talk about wingspan or feathers or something, and they don't tend to be like, oh yeah, by the way, they have eyes. So there's these, these levels of features that are sort of uh, or word stacks, so to speak, that have more of a prior probability than others. And so we need to account for that. So the other example that I wanted to do is um, kind of inspired by some of the, the Me Too movement and the and Julia Sill just done some cool work on this um, gender bias kind of questions. Um, I'm a huge fan of her stuff. As you can tell, because we've done our first executive was over this um, kind of uh, thinking about how do we test um, cultural questions with linguistic data. So what I did was I looked up in COCA the uh, probabilities of he can and she can. Okay. So I've just done this this COCA lookup twice. 
where can was the second word. Um, and then I stuck them together in a data frame and gave them ABCD names so that I could run these analyses across multiple instances. Um, and this is actually what you'll do for your homework. Okay, so be sure you do two of them. And I want to know, is it more likely that we're going to see an attraction of he can than she can? Okay. Or are they going to be more reliant on each other? And so basically, I'm kind of thinking about what are people writing about? Are they writing more about um, when we talk about gender? Are they writing more about that he can do it because there are more men being talked about or there's more about that sort of like power differential um, where for women it might be she might. So let's see. So we're just looking at the word can right now. So I'm going to track, uh, calculate attraction, which is the probability of x given y. Here we've calculated x as can and y as he or she. So it's the probability of can given he or she. And it's called, a, this is attraction. Um, and what we see, do I have that? Given y, yes, down. Okay. Um, what we see is that uh, he is more popular than she. And so uh, it's the probability here of can, given this he or she, and uh, that he or she is in the room, right? Um, and he is more popular. I can do that the other way, this reliance. So what's the likelihood of seeing he or she if can is in the room? And um, so it's a probability of y given x. So I saw a can. Is there going to be a he or she there? Now is the question. And now I can see that it's much more likely that it's going to be a he. So if I say here's um, he or she, what's the likelihood of can? They're a little bit more equal. But here if I see the word can, he is much more likely to come up. <clears throat> But I find these kind of directional probabilities to be a little confusing because you have to remember which one you saw first, so to speak. And that's not in word order, that's just whichever one you saw. So it kind of is a measure of, um, I always try to relate this to sort of friend zones, right? So can's going to have a lot more words related to it. But this particular reliance one is telling me um, if I'm looking at can's friendship circle, he is in there more often than she. And then attraction here is if I'm looking at his friendship circle, can's in there a little bit more than she and can. Uh, but, but that gets to be like, oh, mind numbing. So I really like uh, measures that don't require a directional focus. Um, that is not this one though. but. This one does account for the, um, the effect of the size of the corpus this time. So we've got D included over here. So uh, this one, this particular one's called delta P. And it's just a, oops, sorry, it's a measure, a directional measure that accounts for corpus size. So it's A divided by A plus C minus B divided by B plus D. This is actually very kind of similar to, a, it's not an odds ratio, but it's got that kind of feel to it. Um, and what we see is like, there really aren't that big of a difference between men and women. Men's is still slightly higher. Um, and so to contextualize this number, you have to realize this is divided by 560 billion. So they're very small because the, the individual likelihoods of each of these words is kind of small in that large of a data set. And then if I'm looking at can, how many times is he in the, in the um, friendship circle? And we see it's twice as likely as she, but still these are very small numbers. Okay, so these are probabilities of shared friendship spaces, if you will. And so some people have suggested, well, instead of doing this directional thing, let's calculate chi-square. Okay, so Fisher's exact test is a form of chi-square. 
that um, tells you if there's an association between se uh, several categorical variables. And here we're telling if it's an association between he can or she can. And then the nice thing about this Fisher's exact is it's really handy when the data set is small. At the moment, the data set is not small, right? We have 560 billion words, but if the data set is small, Fisher's exact is more um, mathematically appropriate. And what we can do is instead of just using the p-value, um, we transform those into uh, log numbers, and that gives us two interpretations. If the numbers are positive, there's a mutual attraction between words. If the numbers are negative, there is no attraction or repulsion between words, which I just find funny to say that these words repulse each other, which means their friendship circles are different, right? <clears throat> uh, and then if it's close to zero, there's no relationship. So it kind of transforms a probability um, with a difficult interpretation to this nice easy interpretation. Negative numbers mean they don't occur together, they don't like each other, they're different rooms. Zero means they have a, they're not really related and they don't really care, they're sort of neutral, and positive numbers indicate that they are, they're attracted to each other. This is good for low frequency variable, and you'll see what I mean here in a second, because if we calculate this on our current data set, we're going to get infinity. But I wanted to show you how to calculate it because it's important for a different statistic we're going to use. So we're going to load the Arling library and calculate an expected frequency. So we're going to calculate the like, the expected value of A. So A is the co-occurrence together. In this expected value, if you are familiar with chi-square, this won't be too confusing. If you've never heard of chi, if you've never seen the math on chi-square, this is going to be a little new. But the expected value of A is the row total, so A plus B, times the column total, A plus C going down, divided by the total total. So what's the likelihood or the expected value for cell number A only, cell number A, cell letter A, <laughs> given how much there is in that row and how much there is in that column? So it's a kind of proportioned based on row total and column totals. And that allows us to sort of control for the fact that this, you know, row one is less frequent than row two. All right, we're going to calculate the um, log of the p-value for Fisher's exact test, which is what this does. So you just put in a, b, c, d. We're going to take that um, p-value and translate it into our log score based on the expectation of A. So if the literal value of A is less than the expected value, so that means it's less likely to happen than expected, you take the log of it, which makes it a negative number. If the value of A is greater than the expected value, you take the negative log, which makes it a positive number. Okay, did I do that right? This, like, what are all these like weird blank screens that are going? So remember the p-values are very small. Okay. Yeah, so if a is much smaller than expected, you take the log, it becomes negative. If a is much larger than expected, you take the negative log, and it becomes positive. Just wanted to make sure. Wait, where, now my notes went away. Or is it here? Huh? Nope, lost my notes. Try again. We were here. Now, obviously the biggest problem with this statistic is that if the um, probability becomes very small because the data set is very large, um, effectively this becomes infinity. And I can't compare those two, they're both infinity. So this one's not as popular when the data set is large. So let me show you some other options. And these no longer are directional. This is the conditionalized across the entire table looking at just cell A. All right, so log likelihoods are the ratio of probabilities 
of it being your lexeme or not. And so it's going to, the function is L, L, colic, 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 tongue twister, um, colostruction, okay, which is uh, colexemes. Um, <clears throat> And so we just put in A, B, C, D again. These are nice, easy functions once we have the data set set up. And it does the same thing. If the um, expected value of A is less than, I'm sorry, if the literal value of A is expect, less than expected, it'll be negative, meaning they are repulsed from each other. If it's positive, uh, if it's greater than the expected value, it'll be positive. And so these are log likelihoods. Um, so this has already been logged in the background. And um, we can see that he can is much more popular than she can. Now, the trouble with log likelihoods is they don't have a bounds. So they're only useful in comparison against each other. So I can tell that this one's almost is three times this one. And that's really where their usefulness is. It's looking at um, the differences between several different colexemes. So they are positive, they're attracted to each other, uh, they're not repulsed. Um, but at the moment, I'm kind of like, okay, 38,000, what, how do I measure that number? So I'm not a huge log likelihood fan. Um, I really like PMI and I also really like uh, odds ratios. So let's, let's talk about those. And PMI is the point-wise mutual information. So it's the probability of Y given X divided by the likelihood of Y. And this formula is, um, if you do a little bit of, of separate types of, of conditional math, what we can do is actually take A divided by the expected value of A. Uh, take that log and square it uh, to get PMI. So that's not the literal formula from this, right? The probability of Y divide, given X divided by the probability of Y. It's, it's actually a transform of that. But these are not quite such huge numbers. Okay, so um, when I interpret point-wise mutual information, it's a measure of how much information I know by knowing at least one of those words. So it's the probability of my, basically my second word, if I know the first word already. And he can still much stronger than she can. So one thing I want you to notice is no matter which one you've picked, we've come to the same conclusion. That he can is much more popular than she can. And probably my, my favorite one is log odds because to me this is like just makes the most sense. Um, it's the likelihood of y given the presence of x to the likelihood of y given to the presence of not x. Uh, so that formula mathematically is a times d divided by b times c. And then we take the log of that. And so these are odds ratios. Right? So the likelihood of them occurring together versus not. And so it's a 1.3 log odds to 1 that he can happens more than everything else. And it's kind of a 1.01 .01 to one that she can't happens more than anything else, which means they're not super high log odds ratios, right? So this is not like 10 to one. Um, but now I can still say that he can is 0.3 times more likely than she can. So these kind of give me a little bit more uh, they're like sports betting ratios, so it gives you a little bit more of a feel for what these numbers actually represent. Right? So it's 1.3 to 1. Um, all right. Or 1.3 times, basically, the normal odds. So which one should you use? Um, they all gave you the same answer. They're all supporting the fact that he can stronger than she can. Uh, what's typical in your field? Probably for a lot of you that are like in industry, none of these, right? PMI, I think, is pretty popular in business, but those are different things. So make sure that you're, uh, sometimes this is PPMI, so point, uh, positive point-wise mutual information. Um, 
So not to be confused with a, sort of a stock version of PMI. If the sample size is really small, so the sum of the entire sets of cells, A, B, C, D, is, is small, Fisher's test is going to be your best one, or a log likelihood test. If the large sample size is large, PMI, or if you just want to compare across data sets, odds ratios are much, much easier to think about. Um, because if I tell people it's about betting, it just gets, it just like solidifies into what's, um, what it means. All right, so in summary, this is kind of a short one. Um, we talked about culturomics or ways that we can study culture through language. And what they're doing in their culturomics data is they're basically calculating very long-term frequency um, attraction and reliance measures. And so uh, what we can tell is that burnt and burned have a spot where they start to repulse each other in a different direction. Okay. Um, and then we see that the, the path across time of, um, or the reliance across time of Marc Chagall being published, right, dips. And so now what we have to figure out why that's changing. So culturomics is doing a lot of rather cool like slope and um, smoothing algorithms to look at that stuff over time. We're talking about kind of a more focused analysis, but that's we're doing the same basic idea. Like are these what we might expect or not? Okay, do they come together or they're not? With a couple different ways of calculating association, so how related are words together? because we can't really use correlation um, because these are frequencies of co-occurrence and so there's nothing to really correlate. These are not um, continuous data, at least. Okay, they're just counts. 